He did so love his walkies. His feet jingle jangled at the ends of his ankles. He diddled rapidly about the sidewalk. No straight lines here. To and fro, hither and yon, this way and that, there and back again. Caroming off barriers only he could see, pinballing off invisible rails, ricocheting every which way to the limits of his leash. His limbs dithered excitedly about him, erratic pinwheels of motion. The route was familiar the same as yesterday and the day before, but always shiny new penny fresh. His eyes were wildly agape, fixing for an instant on any and everything in sight, slaking his boundless visual thirst on a vertiginous volute of this and that. The endlessly fascinating shapes, the bright light colors were almost too much, an ecstatic sensory overload. Drool coagulated on his cheeks and swung in hale, flimmy strands from his chin as his head swiveled and bobbed about. Every part of him moved a rhythmic from every other part and always in different directions. He seemed perpetually lost in the act of falling one way or the other, but never quite succeeded, propelled forward by sheer force of momentum. All things held him equally in thrall for a second or two. Unbiased in his attentions, his fickle favors usurped every few moments by something new, new, new. For it was all new to him, never the same twice, a merry enthusiastic redundancy. And oh, weren't his enthusiasms boundless. It was all a delightful hand-clapping much too much. He devoured life like twenty newborns coked to the gills, then just as quickly passed it all through his system like an overcapacitated sponge. He digested not a modicum of it. His curiosity never sated, never, not even for a waking moment, abated. Wonder and awe was his perpetual Gemini state. No eyes were ever wider. His waist hula-hooped on clunkety, scarecrow, loose pelvic joints. Knees akimbo, arms metronoming at a rate all out of sync with his speed. Limbs spun on joints, given divine reprieve from their normal range of motion, belying their intended purpose. His movements were a grand improvisation, the physical interpretation of the most convoluted jazz, the essence of scat. His body was an anarchist dream, a conformist, unyielding nightmare. He was twitchy personified, like a startled squirrel suffering permanent loss of motor control, going nowhere and everywhere at an impressive rate of speed. Neither gravity nor magnetism seemed to have any idea what to do with him, an iconoclast to the core. He thumbed his nose at the both of them, trundling free of their bounds. He bebopped on an electric fence, boogied barefoot on a hot tin roof, kitties on the keys and can't get off, a whoop delight of warped kineticism, a Gordian knot given breath and a pair of sneakers. He walked the walk to the beat of a drum caught in a Texas twister. He was unmatched anywhere on our dear Mother Earth for simultaneous, independent, asymmetrical movement. He loved life and life loved him. Every molecule of his body trying to bear hug a different part of it all at the same time. Every waking instant was for him a momentous occasion. Every plodding step one of discovery. A new world with every footfall. He was the fountainhead of childish delight, its patron saint. He proselytized himself to every new object, all equally worthy of his worship, his unrestrained devotion, a universe of idols, of gods and goddesses, at which to prostrate his bandy frame. He made pilgrim's progress at a remarkable rate, always in the midst of Mecca, always on the way, his body a screaming meme of motion. Enthusiasm was the word of the day, its presence seeping from every pore. Oh, but didn't he oh so madly, but never badly love his walkies. He certainly did. Of that, there was little legitimate question. It was for his mother, however, that they were a living hell, a constant source of torment. 
She suffered daily at the other end of that leash, a tired, bedraggled woman long past her prime, yanked about by that churning Tasmanian devil at the other end. Every day the ritual, every day the gawking, the blatantly averted eyes, the polite, nervous smiles, the laughter, the god-awful humiliation. You'd think, after all those years, she'd be used to it, or at least numb to it. But she was a proud woman, still vain in many respects, and that slobbering St. Vitus dance put a major cramp in her sang Freud. Imagine trying to retain one's aplomb, maintain their equipoise, while at the same time trying to shepherd a herd of neon electric wild weasels down crowded Fifth Avenue, and you begin to grasp the scope of her singular dilemma. She tried keeping him locked away, hidden behind closed doors, the living, breathing skeleton in her family's closet. But after a while, he became absolutely unmanageable. The longer he remained enclosed, the wilder his paroxysms became, to the point where he proved to be a serious danger to himself and to others. She prayed it was simple boredom, a lack of meaningful stimulus, rather than some unavoidable per diem metabolic time bomb. She tried TV, radio, cartoons, virtually anything she could think of to keep him busy. Nothing seemed to work for more than an hour or so except exposure to the out of doors. She'd even tried sedatives, but they made him whine incessantly, a strident, ubiquitous droning. Even if he was unconscious, the whine continued, and his body under absolutely no circumstances was ever known to lay still. By day, he flew about her apartment like a solitary piece of popcorn in a hot air popper, and only at night did he slow to such a degree that he could be confined in a large crib about the size of a king-size bed and padded heavily on all sides. He would grow steadily worse, more frenzied throughout the day, starting at about 4.30 a.m., when he normally opened his eyes. By late afternoon, he reached his peak, a frenetic, panting dervish spinning out of control, often to the point where she supposed his heart must burst or he'd hyperventilate. Neither ever occurred. A touch of divine providence she attributed to God's love of fools, of whom her son was the reigning monarch. As mentioned, the out-of-doors was the only nostrum she'd ever found that would keep him on a, comparatively speaking, even keel. After a good long walk, about an hour or so, he would idle down to a decidedly less manic pace, a burble in place of a roar. To her, he appeared almost introspective, as if he were ruminating on all he'd seen that afternoon. Nobody else suspected this, or if they did, hadn't said anything. It certainly wasn't evident by his expression. A countenance fixed since birth, cherubic with a contrasting thin pinched nose, a single long thick eyebrow set just below a sharply sloping brow, pudgy loose lips framing a mouthful of the tiny teeth he'd been born with, perpetually greased by a viscous coating of mucus and thick elastic spittle. Slack-jawed, eyes blinking languorously, tongue normally adhered to the bottom lip. He wore a look of semi-consciousness. It was a fixed expression, an inanimate mask, betraying no thought or emotion, a bizarre, stolid contrast to the perpetual motion of the rest of his body. So basically, it was a choice between two evils, public humiliation or private insanity. Institutions were out of the question. He was her cross to bear, her thorn to endure, the moat in her eye always staring indolently back in the mirror. He was the means by which her sins were seared away, the trial by fire that strengthened and purified. He was her payment due, her karma come round, her method of immolation, her one-way ticket to martyrdom. She dragged her cross through the streets of Nashville, or more appropriately, it dragged her with all the wounded, pious dignity she could muster. 
Every pitying glance in her direction was a scourge on her back, a well-deserved lash. Bravely she endured, an example for all to see, a lesson for all to learn. He was her burden and hers alone. Her husband's sudden yet not unexpected desertion had seen to that. But her acceptance of all the above didn't make it any easier. Her body ached from the whiplash, jerks, jolts, and strains she endured at the end of that leash. Aspirin didn't cut it anymore, but she was loath to try anything stronger. She didn't trust all those pilled and powdered concoctions with active ingredients she couldn't even pronounce. She developed scowl lines, unattractive wrinkles accentuating her typically austere glare. He was her only companion, but hardly a satisfying one. He'd never even acknowledged her presence in anything more than a purely vegetable fashion. She longed for a compassionate listener, a confidant, someone with whom she could share her trials. But she couldn't leave him, divert her attentions from him, not for a moment. And besides, he was a good listener. She had to give him that. He'd never once interrupted her as she spoke. Daily it went. Her ritual of contrition, she endured her stripes with sublime penitence, administering to the chill blame that formed on her fate the day her son had been born. It's a bouncing baby boy, the doctor told her, mustering the same mock enthusiasm and pithy cliches he presumably slathered on all his patients. Truer words had never been spoken, a prophecy that would haunt her from then on, trouncing her from sunup to sundown. He'd been a bouncer, all right, wriggling so fiercely during her last four months of pregnancy that she remained perpetually nauseous, a feeling oddly akin to motion sickness. Her only son was a congenital live wire, and the current flowed through her as well. She proselytized herself to his care, accepted the mantle of societal pariah via association with reticent resignation. Her son's care was her living vow and every day, following the lunchtime tradition, travails of seeing to his nutritional needs, which were vast, the two of them ventured outside, and for an hour or so, her stigmata bled anew. He would go worm down the sidewalk, dominating a large portion of it through sheer force of unrestrained kineticism. He was an extemporaneous one-man band, every limb, every digit playing a different tune. He marched not just to a different drummer, but to an entire drum corps, all of them off beaten out of step. He twiddled, he twaddled, he razzmatazzed, he hoochie-coochied. His body was an inexorable force of nature impinging with impunity upon the regulated pace of those with whom he came in contact. He was the last of the Mambo Kings, a five-speed electric maraca, the tacit embodiment of twist and shout. At the drop of a hat from sunrise to sunset, he was ready to rumba. Despite the fact that his eyes remained fixed for the most part, fixed in one direction, they absorbed everything. He was a wide-angle lens, having no center and no periphery. He saw on a 75-millimeter scale an inglorious technicolor, visually inhaling life with snide punk abandon. His states of being were ooh and ah. Stars twinkled for him in the daytime. The sun winked and warbled at the sight of him. Mother Moon peekabooed above the horizon, making funny faces, her nimbus suffused with a satisfied glow. He was sugar, he was spice, he was puppy dog tails and Mexican jumping beans. He was ice cube and hot oil. His blood fizzed with heady, exuberant carbonation. And he never missed the left turn at Albuquerque. He was the Ayatollah of rock and rolla, the sultan of swing, the patron saint of perpetual motion. His body was a giggle, his eyes a squeal, his mind a sieve. He drank life from a dribble glass. His well-worn sneakers squeaked and scooched down Fifth Avenue. A bushel full of tambourines rattled in his bottom. His limbs scrawled mandalas, lickety-split in the air about him. 
His pulse beat mystic rhythms in his veins. All the world is a stage and all life a dance. He danced without affectation, without restriction, lacking all restraint, remorse, or shame. He was born with God's boogie shoes adhered to his feet, snuggling his twitchy little toes. He guzzled every evanescent experience as if it were Olympian ambrosia. Never once did he stop to smell the roses, for they sprouted endlessly within him. Unique among his fellows, he knew how to walk the walk. And actions speak loudest of all. He did so love his walkies.